the Gospels, written by eyewitnesses or not. Let's dive in. Traditionally, the Gospels have been credited to two guys who were there, Matthew and John, and two others, Mark and Luke, who either knew folks who were there or had access to first-hand accounts of Jesus' life and teachings. This neat little setup has been the go-to story for ages, but modern scholars, being the curious and skeptical bunch they are, have poked holes in this narrative. They've debated, dissected, and in most mainstream circles, tossed out these traditional claims. This, of course, has sparked quite the academic showdown, with traditionalists fiercely defending the old views. Now let's talk about the genre of the Gospels, another scholarly battlefield. Most academics these days categorize them as Greco-Roman biographies. Sounds fancy, right? But what does that mean exactly? Here's where opinions start flying. Should we consider them generally reliable documents? If they're based on eyewitness accounts, shouldn't we take them more seriously? It's a question that keeps scholars busy, and depending on whom you ask, you might get a completely different answer. So the debate rages on, blending historical analysis with a dash of academic drama here to settle the age-old debates about who really wrote the Gospels. However, I will stir the pot by highlighting how the Greco-Roman way of dealing with eyewitnesses muddies the waters of Gospel testimonies, Paul's Corinthian Creed, and Papias. Instead of diving into authorship debates, let's focus on how eyewitnesses were used and sometimes invented in Greco-Roman literature. In Greco-Roman works, eyewitness accounts were often used or misused to add credibility to narratives. But this doesn't mean the accounts were reliable. Even if the Gospels were penned by actual witnesses, we can't just take their word for it. Modern skepticism is totally justified. Greco-Roman literature is full of tales where eyewitnesses conveniently witness extraordinary events that glorify the hero of the story. Ancient writers were not above fabricating fictional witnesses to serve their narratives, a practice even admitted by early Christian scribes. So while popular opinion may lean on eyewitnesses to validate gospel claims, the truth is that these sources are as flexible as a gymnast in Greco-Roman historiography and literature. So let's get one thing straight. Even if the Gospels do have some eyewitness testimony behind them, that doesn't automatically make them historically accurate. The whole debate about whether Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John actually wrote them is a red herring when it comes to trusting these documents. For this video, I want to zero in on the big ticket items, the jaw-dropping miracles like Jesus' healings and the resurrection. These are the kinds of events that theoretically should have left a massive, undeniable footprint on any witnesses. But here's the kicker. Similar miracles are all over the place in ancient texts. Eyewitnesses claim that even mythical figures like Asclepius were pulling off miraculous healings. This suggests that eyewitnesses, regardless of how genuinely they believed in what they saw, could be mistaken or even a bit too creative in their storytelling. In other words, just because someone said they saw a miracle doesn't mean it actually happened. On top of that, the Greco-Roman literary world was full of authors who didn't think twice about inventing eyewitnesses to spice up their stories. This was so common that we really shouldn't trust claims about anonymous witnesses in the Gospels, Paul's Creed, or Papias' work. The art of fabricating sources was well practiced 
making the supposedly eyewitness-backed miracles in these texts highly questionable. The Eyewitness and the Godly Miracle Let's talk about one of the ancient world's celebrity miracle workers, Emperor Vespasian. In the first century CE, while hanging out in Alexandria, Vespasian reportedly performed some jaw-dropping miracles. According to the historian Tacitus, two men approached the emperor with some serious ailments. One was blind and the other had a hand that was totally useless. The local physicians had their own ideas about how to treat these guys, but Vespasian, being Vespasian, decided to go on the divine route. Tacitus writes, So Vespasian, believing that his good fortune was capable of anything, and that nothing was any longer incredible, with a smiling countenance and amid intense excitement, on the part of the bystanders, did as he was asked to do. The hand was instantly restored to use, and the day again shone for the blind man. Both facts are told by eyewitnesses, even now when falsehood brings no reward. Tacitus Histories The ancient world was abuzz with tales of miraculous sightings and healings. Many attributed to the god Asclepius. Celsus, cited by Origen in Contra Celsum 324, claimed that a multitude of eyewitnesses attested to these miracles. Isolus, in his Peon to Asclepius, even recounted meeting Asclepius himself before the god supposedly helped Sparta win a battle. The temples of Asclepius were filled with inscriptions and literary works where people swore they were healed by him and even conversed with him directly. Some claimed to have been resurrected by Asclepius, as Apollodorus noted in the library 310-3-4, where he mentioned individuals who left their own accounts of these experiences Several first-hand accounts of miracles of Asclepius are documented in Wendy Cotter's Miracles in Greco-Roman Antiquity. Exorcisms, too, were a part of this miraculous narrative. Josephus, for instance, documented an exorcism by a man named Eleazar, who, using the wisdom and powers of Solomon, expelled the demon in the presence of Vespasian and his sons. Miraculous claims weren't limited to healing and exorcisms. Alexander the Great reportedly caused the sea to recede, an event witnessed by Callisthenes and recorded in Eustathius's commentary on the Iliad, 1329. Augustus, too, was said to control the sea and weather, showcasing a divine favor that further cemented his authority. In Roman tradition, witnessing miraculous events associated with the death of an emperor, particularly their ascension to the heavens, was quite common. One notable account comes from the historian Cassius Dio, who provides a vivid description of such a miracle and even names the witness. Now these rumors began to be current at a later date. At the time, they declared Augustus immortal, assigned to him priest and sacred rites, and made Livia, who was already called Julia and Augusta, his priestess. They also permitted her to employ a lictor when she exercised her sacred office. On her part, she bestowed a million sesterces upon a certain Numerius, Atticus, a senator, an ex-praetor, because he swore that he had seen Augustus ascending to heaven after the manner of which tradition tells concerning Proculus and Romulus, Cassius Dio, Roman History, 
5646. Cassius Dio spills the tea about a senator who saw Drusilla take a celestial elevator ride up to the heavens by ascending. Roman History 5911. Seneca backs this up, adding a bit of flair by mentioning a guy who witnessed both Drusilla and Claudius floating up skyward. Apocalypsentosis 1 2. Then there's Aurelius Victor, who narrates an event that eerily echoes the zombie like resurrection of the saints described in Matthew 27 52. On the other hand, the senators were not swayed by the entreaties of the emperor to accord him, Hadrian, the honor of deification. So deeply did they mourn the loss of so many men of their order. However, after those whose death they were grieving suddenly appeared, and each one embraced his relatives and friends, they sanctioned what they had refused. Just like the divine happenings around Jesus, the Greco-Roman tradition also had some pretty spectacular events when a revered figure passed away and became a god. In Rome, it was a big deal to witness the mystical powers or the ascension of the emperor. This tradition is well documented and reminds us of the stories of Romulus and Julius Proculus. According to the tale, Julius saw Romulus return after being taken up and turned into a god. Romulus then gave Julius the task of announcing his new divine status to the world and setting up his worship. This witnessing of deified figures started a tradition. Whenever an emperor was to be deified by the Senate, a witness like Numerius Atticus was brought forward to testify to the emperor's ascension. Christians knew about these eyewitnesses, and they had some strong feelings about them. Tertullian, a Christian writer, didn't hold back his disdain. He wrote, Where shall I rejoice? Where shall I exult? Watching so many kings who are reported to have been received in heaven, along with Jupiter himself, and the witnesses themselves who groan together in the depths of hell. Tertullian isn't the only one chatting about Jupiter and those ascension traditions. What we can gather is that eyewitnesses were the ultimate hype crew for boosting the fame and power of big shots, be they gods, heroes, emperors, or just noteworthy individuals. Usually, these were men, though occasionally noble women like Drusilla got in on the action. Witnesses were like ancient paparazzi, ready to swear they saw miracles from folks who might not have even existed. Historians with a wave of their vague hands often called upon these supposed witnesses to back up some miraculous story about a person. Now, when it comes to the Gospels, the whole eyewitness testimony claim falls into that murky historian territory. Out of the four Gospels, only Luke and John claim their leaning on eyewitness accounts. The other two? Total silence on how they pieced their stories together. The idea that these Gospels used eyewitness testimony, or that the authors were witnesses themselves, only popped up later in the second century. Even if we roll with the idea that every claim of using eyewitnesses is somewhat legit, the actual usefulness of these testimonies comes with some pretty hefty hesitations requiring doubt. Inventing Witnesses and Later Church Tradition the tradition of sketchy eyewitnesses pops up in all sorts of literary works, including ancient biographies. One of the most notorious examples is Philostratus' character, Damis. Damis was supposedly a buddy of Apollonius of Tyana, 
and claim to have documented Apollonius's life on tablets. These tablets supposedly made their way to Julia Domna and eventually to Philostratus. But here's the catch. There's no mention of Damis or his tablets anywhere outside of Philostratus' writings. Ancient biographers had a knack for creating sources out of thin air to make their stories more believable. They often claimed to have found eyewitness documents about events or famous figures that never really existed. For example, William Hansen points out Antonius Diogenes' novel, The Wonders Beyond Thule. In its preface, Diogenes claims his novel is based on the adventures of Danius, which were inscribed on wooden tablets, discovered by Alexander the Great's troops and later handed down to him. Hansen also mentions another supposed discovery in the Journal of the Trojan War. This work claims to be based on the account of Ditzes, a survivor of the mythical Trojan War, who supposedly wrote his story on wooden tablets. Hansen finds numerous other examples where authors likely fabricated these first-hand accounts to give their work a veneer of authenticity. In Damis' case, it's likely the same story, pure fiction. Just like Diogenes' tale, Philostratus claims that Damis' account came to him on tablets, mirroring Diogenes' story closely. Philo of Byblos probably did the same thing with his Phoenician history, claiming he translated it from an ancient Phoenician account by Sekoniathon, who supposedly lived millennia ago. Oddly enough, this account is packed with Hellenistic historiographical tropes and conventions, making it look more like a creative invention than a historical translation. One of the most famous examples of a made-up source is Plato's creative use of his ancestor, Solon. According to Plato, Solon supposedly took a trip to Egypt and learned about the traditions of Atlantis from the priest there. He then left these stories in an unfinished Greek form. Just like with many other tales, this account was passed down until it conveniently became a source for Plato's Critias and Timaeus. Scholars widely believe that Plato invented this story to suit the needs of his dialogues. Authors frequently make up sources to authenticate their work or to write fiction by the second century CE, creating inventive and imaginary letters had practically become its own genre. Philostratus once again provides a prime example. His life of Apollonius is filled with these literary letters. Conveniently, while he mentions several letters, such as between Apollonius and Vespasian, or Apollonius and Musonius, the only ones history has retained are the very ones Philostratus uses in his biography, despite his claims that there were others. Caspric notes. A definite pronouncement about the authenticity of these seven letters cannot be made, but it is doubtless no coincidence that the only letters from the hero to Vespasian retained in the letters, 42 F G, H, and 77F, quoted in 873, are precisely those that Philostratus reproduces. Similarly, whereas according to Philostratus, Apollonius and Musonius wrote other letters to one another, the tradition has only preserved those that the life also transmits, as if the others were simply an invention on his part. The act of selection that Philostratus claims to operate makes his documentary work credible and makes him an exemplary biographer, even though the meeting with Musonius seems to be a real legend. Coincidence is one way to describe the remarkable preservation 
that conveniently favored Philostratus's selected works. While the authenticity of these works is still up for debate, Philostratus wasn't the only one potentially inventing letters as sources. Fictional letters in Greek literature were a common reality, as mentioned earlier. This practice is part of a broader trend among many ancient historiographical authors and those of biography to invent fictional sources to validate their work. These sources were often other literary accounts or unverified hearsay. Take Tacitus, for example. Vague and unknown sources were handy to cite in certain situations. As A.J. Woodman and R.H. Martin discuss, ancient writers rarely cited their sources, but when they did, they usually referenced some vague account or author. Sometimes they did name names. This tactic was usually to boost their credibility, especially when writing something that might make readers raise an eyebrow. So inventing written sources was a pretty common move. The eyewitnesses functioned much the same way as these vague, unnamed, often fictional sources. The eyewitness was not a stable thing, but a malleable character that served the ends of a writer's work. What they actually said, as they are typically unnamed, like Luke's sources, cannot be verified. However, the mere mention of them as supporting some event or tell automatically lends credence to the work. Inventing eyewitnesses and falsely claiming to be an eyewitness were standard tropes and strategies of authentication in historiographical literature, enough so that, as M. David Litwin notes, Lucian complained about it fervently, but it was not simply pagans who were aware of this inventive tradition. Christians were aware of it as well. For example, Origen contends contra Celsus that the witnesses to Asclepius's miracles and divine healings never existed and that as a result, the testimonies of the Christian miracles are supreme and without challenge. It was thus entirely possible in the minds of Christians and pagans alike that an eyewitness account may be fabricated from the start, though the sheer number of Asclepius accounts in particular undercut Origen's particular claim. Early Christian Witnesses and a Double Standard so was the New Testament penned by actual eyewitnesses, or at least based on their testimonies? That's a tricky question. We can't say for sure, but let's dive into some juicy details that might shed some light. First off, the first mentions of the Gospels being linked to their traditional authors pop up pretty late in the game. Even Simon Gathercole's recent analysis points to Papias as the earliest source of these claims. However, many accounts gather coal lists, like those from Clement, the Muratorian fragment, and Irenaeus seem to have borrowed heavily from Papias's work. It seems like the idea of who wrote the Gospels in the second century might have started with Papias and then spread like wildfire. Now, was Papias working with the same gospel texts we have today? It's debated, but let's assume he was. Should we trust Papias' claims? Well, not necessarily. Back in the day, slapping an eyewitness label on something, or just making one up, was a common trick. For example, Papias' claim that Matthew translated from a Semitic language into Greek reminds us of other ancient tales, like Philo of Byblos supposedly translating from Phoenician, or Solon translating Egyptian tales about Atlantis. 
So it's wise to be skeptical about Papias' tradition being 100% authentic. As Robin Faith Walsh puts it, anonymity and the eyewitness tag were often just rhetorical devices not to be taken at face value. Similarly, the idea that Mark was Peter's interpreter jotting down his memories and sermons is reminiscent of the fictional companion Damis of Apollonius. Adding more to the mix, Papias never claimed he met the actual eyewitnesses. According to Eusebius, Papias only mentioned knowing friends or students of the apostles. Eusebius even quotes Papias, saying he got his info from these anonymous folks who supposedly had the scoop on the apostles. In a nutshell, even if Papias' claims refer to the Gospels we know today, they might be just as made up as other ancient sources used for self-authentication. In fact, there is some evidence that points to Papias being directly engaged in these inventive and anonymous witness authentication acts that we see with Greco-Roman literature. He claims, according to Eusebius, that the daughters of Philip told him wondrous tales, that one person was raised from the dead in his own time, and that Justice Barsabbas drank poison, but that God kept him from all harm. Eusebius also claims that Papias even recorded new sayings from Jesus about the end times. This leads Eusebius to have a rather low opinion of Papias' intelligence. Papias is also infamous for reporting a story of Judas' death that is unlike any recorded in the canonical Gospels. He describes the traitor swelling up like a grotesque balloon so massive that he couldn't even squeeze through a gap wide enough for a chariot. And then, in a finale worthy of a horror show, Judas burst open, showering the ground with his insides. Truly trustworthy reporting, right? Not. It seems like Papias was right at home with the Greco-Roman tradition of spinning creative tales and inventing eyewitness accounts. His stories might just be, well, stories. There's even a theory that Papias made up the account of Mark by claiming Mark was the author of that gospel based on the synonymous letter, 1 Peter 4.13, which he knew well. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. So does Mark, my son. Over time, Papias himself became part of the myth-making machine, with later writers saying he acted as a scribe. Now let's assume for a second that Papias' stories aren't fictional, just highly imaginative, or maybe he was duped by people pretending to be friends of the disciples. Even if Papias wasn't just making stuff up, eyewitnesses back then and even now were more than willing to stretch the truth or attest to things they didn't actually see, but believed happened. Should we take at face value the testimonies about Asclepius performing miracles? Alexander the Great making the sea part for him? Caesar's being whisked up into heaven? Or the dead rising in mass after Hadrian's death to chat with their families? These tales show that eyewitnesses could be pretty flexible with the truth. Anonymous eyewitnesses like the ones John, Luke, and Paul mention are super handy for storytelling. They can't be verified, checked, or identified, but they add a nice touch of authority to grand claims about miraculous events from the past. As historians, though, we can't build solid cases on such anonymous accounts, especially when the Greco-Roman tradition is filled with these unverifiable witness claims used to validate all sorts of marvels. Here's a juicy tidbit for you. There's a bit of a double standard in New Testament studies. Imagine this, 
no New Testament scholar would hesitate to call out the miracles of folks like Vespasian, Alexander, and Asclepius as pure invention or creative storytelling by supposed witnesses or writers. They might even suggest that Tacitus just made up the whole narrative and the witnesses along with it. No biggie, right? That's what you'd expect. But when it comes to the Gospels, it's a whole different ball game. These texts somehow dodged the same level of scrutiny. Instead of waving off the miraculous as creative liberties, scholars churn out hundreds of pages trying to justify these traditions and find reasons to give them a free pass. It's like the Gospels have some kind of scholarly shield protecting them from the same skepticism applied to Greco-Roman texts. As Justin Meggett aptly points out, this discrepancy highlights an interesting bias in the field. But New Testament scholars should concede that the kind of history that is deemed acceptable in their field is, at best, somewhat eccentric. Most biblical scholars would be a little unsettled if, for example, they read an article about Apollonius of Tyana in a journal of ancient history that began by arguing for the historicity of supernatural events before defending the veracity of the miracles ascribed to him, yet would not be unsurprised to see an article making the same arguments in a journal dedicated to the study of the historical Jesus, referencing a miracle defense from Lycona in JSHS. So here's a wild idea. What if we looked at the New Testament the same way we look at other Greco-Roman literature? We'd need to remember that eyewitnesses weren't exactly rock solid or reliable when it came to miracles and grand claims. Plus, those later claims about who wrote what? Often pure fiction. Papias' fragments already show some of those self-authenticating tricks of making up sources. What about the New Testament itself? Well, several texts in it falsely claim to be written by eyewitnesses or key apostles to give themselves a bit more street cred. Two of the Gospels even use eyewitness claims, but they keep things nice and anonymous, a common Greco-Roman trick to give the narrative a boost of authenticity while making sure no one could actually check the facts. Take the Gospel of Luke, for instance. It's pretty safe to say Luke's claims of using eyewitnesses are likely bogus, just mimicking the usual rhetorical strategies of Greco-Roman writers. We know he used Mark as a source, but Luke keeps that under wraps. Why? Either he didn't know the name or, more likely, he was following the Greco-Roman playbook of keeping sources anonymous to avoid verification. This shows he's using the same old tricks and supports the idea that his so-called eyewitnesses are probably made up. The Gospel of John pulls a similar stunt with the mysterious disciple whom Jesus loved. Scholars have spilled endless ink trying to figure out who this is. But here's the kicker. They were never supposed to figure it out. This figure was likely a rhetorical invention meant to give the narrative some fake authenticity without being verifiable. There is no real disciple whom Jesus loved to identify because the whole point was to have an unidentifiable figure who could supposedly back up the story as an eyewitness. Even if we give Luke and John and Paul's creed in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, the benefit of the doubt and assume their eyewitnesses were real, which we should doubt as a serious option, it doesn't change the fact that eyewitnesses weren't exactly reliable when it came to miracle claims. History shows that eyewitnesses were more than ready to vouch for all sorts of things that didn't actually happen, even if they sincerely believed them. Take the ascension of Caesar, for example. This was so widely witnessed that Tertullian couldn't help but chuckle at the thought of these witnesses burning in hell with Jupiter. Christians and pagans both knew 
that eyewitnesses could be, and often were, conveniently invented. They weren't always trustworthy. The literary tricks in Greco-Roman literature give us plenty of reasons to doubt the authenticity of all the traditions about who wrote the Gospels and the supposed eyewitness testimony. Whether you buy into the traditional claims or not, these literary techniques were commonly used to fabricate sources and stories, making it tough to take any of these accounts at face value. Eyewitnessing the Conclusion Augustus ascended into the heavens, backed up by an eyewitness. When Hadrian died, a bunch of dead supposedly rose to meet with their families, who claimed they saw and touched them. Callisthenes himself reported that the sea bent and receded at Alexander the Great's command. Eyewitnesses swore they interacted with Asclepius, witnessed his healing powers, and saw him raise the dead. Even in Tacitus's time, people claimed Vespasian performed healing miracles, proving his divine powers granted by the Roman gods. Fast forward to modern times, and we have Saint Mother Teresa performing miracles and healing people from tumors. The takeaway here is that eyewitnesses were incredibly flexible literary devices in Greco-Roman literature. They were misrepresented, invented from scratch, falsely claimed to have witnessed miraculous events, or said to have passed down stories to the author. This practice is well documented. Origen himself claimed that witnesses to Asclepius were fake, while Tertullian happily consigned those same witnesses to hell. Lucian pointed out the falsification of eyewitnesses, and various novels and historical works used vague and anonymous witnesses to verify their stories while remaining unverifiable themselves. So what does this mean for the Gospels and Paul's Corinthian Creed? While Matthew and Mark didn't claim to be based on eyewitness testimony, someone else tacked that on later, Luke and John used the same anonymous witness style as other Greco-Roman authors. Even more eyebrow-raising is Papias, who had a knack for citing unverifiable traditions, supposedly known only to him or to anonymous friends of the apostles. His approach is strikingly similar to these creative literary practices. All right, let's play along and assume these traditions are spot on. With eyewitnesses behind these tales, what stands out is that these eyewitnesses, whether they're talking about Vespasian, Alexander, Asclepius, or any other ancient celebrity, were given the power and, seemingly, the duty to vouch for events that either didn't happen or were exaggerated to glorify their heroes. So even if the Gospels and Paul did lean on eyewitness accounts, it doesn't bring us any closer to believing in the historicity of Jesus' miracles than it does for the miracles attributed to Vespasian, Alexander, Asclepius, Augustus, Hadrian, Apollonius, Drusilla, Claudius, Romulus, and so on. Miracles were a dime a dozen, and so were the supposed witnesses even for figures and events that never existed. We simply can't take these ancient miracle stories at face value. If we're supposed to trust the eyewitnesses in the Gospels, whether named or anonymous, then we should also trust the eyewitnesses of the countless other miracles, visions, and ascensions in the ancient Greco-Roman and other traditions. The fact that we don't take pagan tradition seriously means we should apply the same skepticism to the New Testament. These eyewitnesses were just like any others, either creative or completely fabricated. Thanks to Chrissy Hansen for her brilliant research in this video. We at MythVision truly appreciate her efforts and hope you enjoyed this education. 
please be sure to like this video so the YouTube gods have eyewitness to the mortals' appreciation of this content. Just maybe, they will take us up into the heavens via ascension and make this go viral. Leave a comment with your name as the source or anonymously and share this video with others the same way Papias seemed to pass along his stories. Please consider joining our Patreon and YouTube membership family to continue making these videos possible. We could really use your help. Also take your learning to new levels by signing up for one of the scholarly courses we have at www.mvp-courses.com. We have several different courses by scholars, even some mentioned in this video, like Robin Faith Walsh, with her courses on the Apostle Paul and the Gospels. She really gets it. Also, we have a course with M. David Litwa on the mystery religions of the Greco-Roman world, even comparing them to early Christianity. There are several more academics who are in the vein of this work that we have courses by, such as Dennis R. MacDonald and Richard C. Miller, which go into the Greek and Roman sources. Richard Miller covers the eyewitness trope and many other translation fable tropes for Christian origins. If you sign up, you own the courses for life. We are very thankful for all you do and hope you never forget. We are Myth Vision.